All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And I'm here in a lovely, bright uh, San Diego as usual. And today I'm joined by DJ Sebastian, who's over in lovely Columbus, Ohio. How are you doing, DJ? Hi, John. I'm doing great. How about yourself? Uh, absolutely great. And DJ has a, has had a long sales career, um, worked at IBM, and then uh, did uh, for the SAS Institute uh, leading data analytics. Uh, and you were involved in at the epicenter of helping customers implement innovative solutions like artificial intelligent data analytics, cloud environments. Uh, and all that good stuff. And uh, DJ then authored a really interesting book, The Selling Revolution, Prospering in the New World of Artificial Intelligence. And DJ, right, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of talk about AI and sales over the last few years. And I think people are struggling to separate the hype or the myths from the reality about what's going to happen. So from your perspective, um, can you give people a kind of a realistic view of what's coming with AI and sales and what they can expect and what maybe is overhyped. Sure. Some of the hype is that it's going to be Armageddon. It's going to be the end to all sales careers. Some is going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. And it's a good tool for salespeople to have access to. So it's somewhere in the middle. So mm -hmm. it'll evolve as more capabilities are made available, but we're, we're at a, 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 junction point where there's so much technology out there that enables um, all this automation. And it happened 25 years ago in factories when mm -hmm. robots kind of took over a lot of skilled labor. And some of that is already starting to come into the sales, sales force. Now, you can view it as one of two ways. You can look at it as I can use AI as another tool and the elite salespeople will do exactly that. How can I leverage this information that I'm getting from the deep analytics or from artificial intelligence to help me prospect better, to help me identify a territory plan? What are the best top 10, top 20 uh, accounts that I should go after based on the information we have in our CRM? or the company has in their 10K and 10Q financial reports. So some of those things being able to crunch through all that data are going to tremendously help the elite salesperson. On the other side of it, if all you're doing as a salesperson is uh, blocking and tackling and just doing things like generating quotes and responding mm -hmm. to RFPs and uh, responding to emails where the potential customer asks for information, those jobs are going to be automated. And unless you can step it up to get to the point where you can do, you can build better relationship with your clients and show them value at each interaction, mm -hmm. those jobs are in danger. So, so basically, um, you know, what you're saying is, okay, that you can look at this as this could be a fantastic thing where it it eliminates a lot of of rote tasks a lot of you know data entry a lot of things that really don't add that much value and uh, in it, things that need to happen but don't add that much value plus you can gain intelligence out of the system that can make you a more insightful intelligent salesperson so it's as you say it's the ones who go okay now i can be even more valuable by focusing on the areas that I can bring value as opposed to this is a threat to me. Exactly right. And also be more productive where you're mm -hmm. not spending hours and hours doing research. You're not spending hours going through your CRM to identify who should I call, who should I, you know, prospect, who should I put on my forecast list. You're actually able to spend more time with the customer providing value, having, you know, mm -hmm. substantive conversations with those customers. And what are some of the what are some of the business um, trends that are really driving this automation? Because automation is obviously, as you said, I mean, it's been in um, it's been in manufacturing forever in other areas, but it's now coming into into um, into sales and other areas in a way that it never has before. So, what do you think is driving? There's that? really there's really three trends that are that are kind of forming this perfect storm together with the technology. First is 
the way customers buy is changing mm -hmm. with so much information out there on the on the web customers can do about 90 to 95% of their analysis before they even picked up the phone to contact a salesperson or get a call from a salesperson so they kind of know what they're looking for before they even engage and there's also in the world we're in uh, many customers don't even like dealing with salespeople, the, the, the ones that aren't going to be giving them value. So there's a salesperson avoidance that we have to get over where mm -hmm. if customers can just completely uh, perform the transaction online without engaging a salesperson, they'd rather do that. Secondly yeah. is social communications. So everything is done through text and emails and there's so much less conversation uh, where a salesperson can ask open-ended questions and identify needs. So when it's just a, a communication through those electronic means, we can't get as much value out of it as a salesperson. So that mm -hmm. as we get more and more of the younger generation who is in a buying positions where they're used to playing video games and spend their days with Fortnite and yeah. Minecraft. They don't see the value in bringing on a salesperson. And mm -hmm. third, Salesforce, Salesforce productivity. Companies are always looking to uh, reduce their cost of sales and everybody initially wants to just grow their sales force and then they find out that you know half of them aren't producing, so what do they do with them? They invest a lot in training or yep. they just cut them loose. So last last year, only about 53% of salespeople hit their number, hit their quota. Mm -hmm. And the, um, um, the, the other thing is that the sales vice presidents have an average tenure of 19 months with a company. So yep. we have such a short-term mindset in the business world where it's either deliver quickly or hit the road. And mm -hmm. these companies are looking for tools and capabilities where they can improve that. Yeah, and I think uh, you hit on an interesting point now is uh, about the uh, about buyer behavior, right? And that uh, we've all become very good at, at leveraging technology to hide away as much as possible and to put as many barriers between us and a salesperson as humanly possible, right? Or as not even humanly possible, as technology, technologically possible. So that raises a whole um, raft of new challenges is how you communicate and how uh, how a buyer wants to be communicated with. And one of the chapters you, in your book, you say the next generation sales team and who will prosper. So let's talk about that. If I, if we have a buyer that's more informed, that's more adept at hiding, right? <laughs> that's, that is much, is much uh, more comfortable now with dictating how and when and, and by what means they want to communicate. Uh, how does this next generation sales team you know, break through all those perceived barriers. Yes, what we found is the elite salesperson needs to be looked at as a valued consultant rather than somebody just mm -hmm. interrupting the buyer's day. So yeah. you do that by cultivating a strong relationship. And how do you do that? It's by providing value and, and taking the customer on a path to where they can see where their life is going to be better. Their company is going to be better. They could even be heroes uh, with your product or solution. So when you, when it comes down to that relationship, it's not a friendship thing. It's a, what, what can you do for me now? And those elite, elite salespeople always look to identify areas where they can help the customer do a better job or improve a process. And, you uniquely become a partner that can help them perform better. Yeah, because let's face it, right? There's a flip side to all of this too, is right. I mean, I, might, I as a buyer may have tons of information and all of this, but I also have tons of information, right? So <clears throat> I have too much information and it's making it harder and harder for me to know exactly what information I should believe, even synthesize it or digest that information. So there is a great opportunity here for the elite salesperson, as you say, to cut through the noise and become that advisor to me. But you have to be able to bring me something that makes me 
cons- consider you as, as somebody who could be an advisor? Yeah, because the easiest answer is we're, we're already doing that. We already yeah. have a supplier that's <clears throat> providing that. So instead of that, we coach our clients to say, come up with three unique, innovative ideas. So you might have to do some research. You might have to look at what their financial reports are, their mm-hmm. in, their investor presentations where they tell the marketplace what they're doing, where they're trying to improve. So if you can glean some information out of that and your solution can help with that, you are in a strong position to be able to say, hey, Mr. Customer, I've got something that you might be interested in. We're also doing this with XYZ company in the road, mm. down the road, and they are getting 22% improved metrics by this and this and this. So once you do that, once you come up with an innovative uh, solution like that idea, you have the opportunity. Now, who wouldn't, which, which executive wouldn't say, yeah, I want to know more about how you can give me a, a, an innovative idea. So mm-hmm. you've got to do that in terms of how you can present that as a valued consultant rather than a salesperson just looking for a transaction. Yeah. And, and I think, and the point there is, as you say, you have to be able to deliver the innovative idea and not, uh, you know, if you get somebody's time not to then go into well, before before I get to that, DJ, just let me tell you a little bit more <laughs> about something that you don't want to know about. Okay, um, so the you know, you've got to leverage your time. So I see you've got an interesting one here too about shorten your work week by avoiding time wasters. What do you mean by that? Every salesperson I've talked to, and I've done this too. I say mm-hmm. I could work twenty four hours a day, and I still wouldn't get everything done. Well. Mm-hmm. Part of it, you look at your day, and if you're in front of your customer 90% of the time, go for it. But, yeah. you know, typically you might have 25, 30%, 50% of your time in front of the customer. So, how's the other time spent? So, sometimes we get into a mode where <clears throat> we're just looking for activity. Oh, somebody mm-hmm. has a conference call or somebody has a meeting that day. All right, do I really need to attend that meeting? Some you do. To keep yeah. your job, that's the que- that's a mm-hmm. test, is will I get fired if I don't attend this meeting? Is it a compliance thing? Is it a, you know, our sales team getting together? Or is somebody just going to communicate the latest and greatest of a product that we could just, you know, click on a link and get mm-hmm. that information? Another area is uh, responding to RFPs. Oh, let's put the team together. Let's put a team of five people together technical people, subject matter experts, contracts people, and put together this RFP because, you know, maybe we got a shot at this business. But if you didn't qualify it, and if you didn't help build the content Mm -hmm. or influence that RFP, your chance of winning that business is what, 5%, maybe 10%. So those are huge time wasters. And you're not even, you're not even wasting just your time. You're wasting time of other resources resources that can be deployed in much more strategic efforts. Yeah, I, I mean, I have to agree. I think that's, I think if there was one thing that uh, people could look at in 2020 that would make a massive difference to the job, it's exactly what you're talking about, is looking about, looking at what are the low value to no value activities that take up your time. And also, DJ, I hear this all the time, you know, people say, oh, you know, we're, we're busier than we've ever been. This is the busiest we've ever been. And I go, nah. Is it, or is it this most? Is it the most distracted we've ever been? Because we have our, we have our phones jumping at us. We have all this. We have information at our fingertips. If you're, if right now, if you're a football fan, how much time are you spending looking at uh, the playoffs and all that kind of stuff, as opposed <laughs> to doing? Yeah. So I think, I think looking at how you spend your day and the activities and where you invest your time is is a really, really critical thing because you may find that you actually have a lot more value time at your disposal. Exactly. And if you're looking at at growing your skills, one of the things Mm -hmm. we teach is a course on becoming a great communicator to help you sell more. So if you spend an hour in the evening or four hours on the weekend by applying this this training to this skill Mm -hmm. that can help you be better the next time you're in front of the customer, isn't that a better use of time than (laughs) streaming or, 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 you know, watching Netflix streaming shows for the whole weekend? Sure it is. 
Yeah. Well, that's all. That's another one of my um, soapboxes that I often get on is the idea of I guarantee you that if you if most people take a look at their life and they look at their hobby, right, and say you say you play golf, for instance, I bet you spend invest quite a bit of time practicing your swing. Maybe you actually invest in a coach, you know, private coach to help you and all that. But the golf doesn't put bread on your table. So how much time are you investing in improving your actual job performance? Maybe hiring a coach to help you with that, maybe taking one of your courses or whatever. So I think sometimes, you know, when people are are maybe not being as successful as they want to as they would like to be, they have to take a look at where are you investing your time and money. Exactly. The elite have to have a passion a passion. Mm -hmm. And good times and challenging times. Uh, no matter what happens, you you need to plow through. You need to have grit and and push through to make sure that you can keep going. And passion will get you a lot further than just going through the motions. Mm -hmm. So, in the last few minutes that we have here, DJ, what are some other things that sales people should be looking at now? Given the fact that there's technology is breathing down their neck, the the, the buyer is is more uh, sophisticated or more confused or just more hidden than ever. So, what are some of the things that you can start to do? One of the things that's that's emerging is a, a function of a. Uh, we'll call it a sales technology analyst. Mm -hmm. So all of our salespeople aren't going to become experts in advanced analytics or AI. They'll yeah. know the application of the tools, but there is somebody in the organization that is going to be part data scientist, part analyst, and part salesperson to be able to put together uh, the information. So you know, a, a request comes in from the sales team that says, you know, we need to know how many of our customers have this business problem because we've got a great solution. And so running through the data, if they've got, you know, good data in their CRM mm -hmm. or they can get to it, uh, that's, that's going to be an emerging thing that's going to help the salespeople become more successful. It's happening in sports already. Coaches use analytics to be able to identify trends and how they can position their game plans. So that, yeah. that's one of the things. Another is just being able to um, run your sales cycle as a project. So mm -hmm. oftentimes a salesperson views um, the cycle as just a random set of events. Well, no, it the customer will appreciate you more if you're taking a professional approach. Whenever they, whenever they institute any kind of program internally, they have a project plan. They have mm -hmm. somebody who's checking on the status. So use the same thing. Use a sequence of events with the customer to say, here's what we're going to go through. Here are the nine steps or the four steps or the 17 steps we need to go through to do business together. And at each step of the way, you, you check off the box that says, are we ready to move forward? If so, fine. If not, okay, nice. It's been nice working with you. Maybe we'll catch up another time. <laughs> and at what, at what time are we going to do that? So mm -hmm. by using that method of uh, managing like a project, your sales cycles, you actually, when you, when you sit in on those forecasting calls, you got a better idea of where you really are, whether you're just pulling a number out of the mm -hmm. air. Yeah, and you, exactly. I mean, that's why, um, you know, Pipeline or CRM, we often call it the process engine because um, us, um, all research and statistics, statistics have shown that the highest performing sales teams are the ones that have a sales process, that follow the sales process diligently, and that have actual step steps and things that need to happen within each stage of their process so properly exactly. managed like end to end so i I, to, I totally agree with you there and i think we just need to get over eventually this thing where some sales of people still believe that process is things that happen to other people and that theirs is just <laughs> you know it's a it's an art yeah you know, i just i'm jackson pollock i just throw my paint at the at the canvas and somehow the sale happens if it and, worked know, that way not, anybody could be a exactly or even a Jackson Pollock. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, listen, uh, DJ, this has been uh, fantastic. Very interesting stuff. The book is The Selling Revolution, Prospering in the New World of Artificial Intelligence. 
Uh, you'll see in the contributor in DJ's bio below this video, you can get all the information about DJ, get linked to his book and his website. Um, anywhere else uh, that you, people should look for you, DJ? Um, my website is thetechseller.com mm -hmm. and you can email me at DJ at thetechseller.com. So there's a lot of good content on that that'll point you to certain aspects. Excellent. Well, listen, this has been great. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. Thanks, DJ, for a fascinating insight into the world of artificial intelligence. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you, John.